Please be seated. Le Président, veuillez vous asseoir. L'audience est ouverte. Mr. Dao and San, could you report the attendance of the parties Greffier. and individuals to today's proceeding? Veuillez faire état de la présence des parties. Dao and San, Mr. Preston, for today's proceeding. Le Greffier, Monsieur le Président. That is Wednesday, the 30th of October, 2013. All parties to the proceeding are present. As for Nunchi, he is present, present in the holding cell downstairs, pursuant to the decision of the trial chamber concerning his health. Thank you. Conformément à la décision de la chambre sur President, thank you. Lié à son état de santé. Le the Président, merci. Like to give the floor now to the lead co lawyers for civil parties. Aux co-avocats principaux des parties civiles to make their rebuttal statement in case 002-01. Vous avez la parole. Good morning, Mr. Good morning, Mr. President, your honors, parties to the proceeding and everyone in the public parties. gallery. Et aux membres du public. The rebuttal statement by the lead colleagues for one hour and ten minutes will be done by two counsels, Lima Nguyen and Mots Swanery. Et sont chargés de présenter nos répliques. Le président, allez-y. May it please the court. Maître My name is Lima Nguyen. I appear on Mesdames behalf of the consolidated juges, group of civil parties. I acknowledge and pay respect to the civil parties who are with us today in this Je room, salue les parties and also to the civil parties, présentes. victims, and the general public sitting Ainsi in the gallery. In this rebuttal, I will respond to the submissions made by Nunchi's defence. My colleague, Mok Sabanari, will later address Kyosun Pong's submissions. Mon the topics that I will cover, ma consoeur, roughly in this order, are Nunchi's claims to moral responsibility, the condition of enslavement, the language regime employed by the Khmer Rouge, Force transfer one and discriminatory sujets. intent against the new people. La reconnaissance Force transfer two and the approach the defence have taken in the presentation of evidence to portray and the existence of a policy to execute former Khmer Rouge, Khmer Republic officials, and finally, Nunchi's rights to a fair trial. It's important that your honours take into account Nunchi's admission that one, he was a senior leader. And two, that he accepts moral responsibility for events during the Democratic Compagnie. However, despite admitting in his closing brief to bearing responsibility for CPK policy, Nunchia continues to deny that he has any legal responsibility for the crimes committed pursuant to those very policies. For Cambodia's population and victims, those policies had a very real effect, lasting adverse generational harm and consequences. 31 civil parties gave evidence during this trial, many of them on victim impact. But there are millions of others. Stories just as heart-wrenching, of which these civil parties comprise uh, but a representative sample. The civil parties submit that moral responsibility, formalized through legal framework, can transfer as legal responsibility. Nunchi's admission to moral responsibility was an acceptance that Part and parcel of his role as Deputy, Deputy Secretary of the Standing Committee came moral obligations. And we assert that gross breaches of those obligations require accountability. Now, unfortunately, the civil parties can only have their moral and collective reparations if he is found legally responsible. So, in light of all that's said and done, at the end of the day, Nunchi's admission to moral responsibility does not amount to very much. 
Nunchi's policies relating to the forced transfers set in motion three years, eight months and 20 days of enslavement. These policies created a situation in which the regime had absolute control over its population. This absolute control entailed the absolute deprivation of people's freedom of movement, freedom of speech, privacy, right to human dignity, and every other fundamental right and freedom that is inherent to being a human being. The regime monitored, supervised, and determined how every person behaved, spoke, and conducted themselves at all times. It determined how every minute of their days were spent, from when they woke up, their hours of work, what they ate, how they ate, how much they ate, who they married, when they slept. This control was exercised through the creation of an overarching system of forced collective labour, starvation, fear, apprehension, distrust, and terror. And under this regime, the victims belonged to the state. The regime possessed their bodies and their minds, treating them as cogs in a machine, as chattel, to be moved around, to be worked and to be gotten rid of when it suited the regime. Now that, your honours, is the exercise of all the powers pertaining to the right of ownership over the Cambodian people. Reducing them to the condition of slavery, and in our submission, this state of affairs is correctly characterized as a slave state. Now, at this point, I'll address the propaganda, the rhetoric, and the belligerent language that, back in 1975, permeated through the Khmer Rouge's actions and activities, and which now, in 2013, filter through the defence submissions. The Khmer Rouge created its own language regime, perhaps the best example of the kind of newspeak and black-white coined by George Orwell in his novel 1984, where war is peace, ignorance is strength, and freedom is slavery. Newspeak is euphemistic language, perhaps uh, often used in political propaganda, standing for the opposite of what it actually means. Now, the purpose of Newspeak is ultimately to disguise the truth by deliberately representing it as a lie and representing lies as truth. When this is done, it is known as black-white, where black is made to mean white and white is made to mean black. I'll give some concrete examples of the sort of newspeak used by the Khmer Rouge regime. The liberation of Phnom Penh really meant the enslavement of Phnom Penh's population. The evacuation of Phnom Penh really meant sending people to the killing fields. Re-education and study sessions were references to arbitrary detention and summary executions. Nunchi's defence, in essence, agree that the Khmer Rouge propagated newspeak. They state that warlike metaphors were used by the CPK to describe ideological and political struggle. Now, in truth, this violent metaphorical language was used to justify Nunchi's aggressive, destructive and criminal policies and his incitement to violence against people he labelled enemies. Nunchi claims that the enemy of the party was not the people themselves, but their state of mind. He argues that getting rid of the enemies was not a reference to the individual, but to the feudalist mentality and systems. In this context, he says that CPK documents instructing Kedra to attack, purge, smash, cleanse the enemy can only be interpreted as smashing capitalism, smashing feudalism, smashing imperialism. Well, the civil party certainly suffered the brunt of this new speak. They ask exactly how do you separate and punish someone's state of mind. 
des conséquences de ce novlangue. Comment peut-on séparer In this trial, et punir quelqu'un pour son état d'esprit Bien la réponse du régime, c'était d'écraser la personne. Dans son procès, Doig a apporté des témoignages cruciaux sur le sens de ces mots. Il n'y a rien avec les politiques établies par les dirigeants. D'abord, il a parlé de la politique du parti. Et il a dit que le but final est que la personne est morte. Il a confirmé que écraser, écraser signifie exécuter, confirmant que, je cite, l'objectif final est de tuer la personne. Et ensuite, les partis civils comprenaient ce nom de l'homme et savaient que l'objectif final est de tuer la personne. Si il devait être rééduqué, il serait finalement écrasé. Le terme Anka, Doig a dit « I use the word Ankar to refer to the party central committee or any person representing Pol Pot or the party central committee. » He also said « I personally regarded Ankar as sometimes Nuchia, sometimes Pol Pot. » Now this accords with what the civil parties understood of the term Ankar, meaning the Khmer Rouge leadership. Je voyais Ankar comme étant parfois Nunchia, parfois Pol Pot. Il était le père de Newspeak. Il a affirmé qu'il était personnellement en charge de la propagande et de l'éducation. Il a dit en ouverture de la direction des Khmer Rouges. Il a été chargé de les éduquer dans la ligne politique et de les éduquer avec le désir de la nation. Il a reconnu ici avoir été chargé de la propagande et de l'éducation. Contradictions such as love of the nation on the one hand and the killing of its people on the other became synonymous. Phrases such as life and death contradiction were used to indoctrinate the regime's philosophy, its policy, and its politics. Doig gave evidence that, I quote, the contradiction between us and our enemy is the life and death contradiction, which means that for one to prosper, the other one must die, unquote. Nunchi's victims understood perfectly what re-education and education meant. Civil Party Sung Sim and Hung Chung Da both gave evidence that those who went for training and re-education never returned. Now, with all due respect, the defence submissions are filled with newspeak and black-white. For example, they continue to argue that what they call the evacuation of Phnom Penh was not unlawful. Well, first of all, we need to put a stop to this black-white. This was not an evacuation. It was a forced movement of a civilian population, not from a place of danger into a place of safety, as the term evacuation evacuate would normally suggest, but rather from a place of safety, safety of their own homes, to a place of danger, to the killing fields. Nunchir and Kusumpong's continual justifications about the reasons for the forced transfer make a mockery of the victims. They continue the line that their purpose was to implement an economic policy that, I quote, they genuinely believed was in the interest of the Cambodian people, unquote. Let me say this in response. Only if freedom is slavery and only if black is white can the death of an estimated 2 million Cambodians be in the best interest of the Cambodian population. The civil parties ask that your honours put an end to the new speak and the black white. The black white that's been, that's been perpetuated by the Khmer Rouge and by the defence. Because until the truth is revealed for what it really was and labelled what it actually is, there cannot be real justice. At this point, I'll move to the topic of forced transfer one. From the beginning, when Nunchia and the senior leaders decided to transfer the population, they deceived the people. They falsely represented that the reason was that if American bombs were imminent. That was a lie then, and it's a lie now. Another example of Nunchi's deceit is the claim that his intentions were to save the population from famine. 
And in doing so, the defence asserted that the forced movement was in itself lawful, necessary and logical. In paragraph 251 of the defence brief, the defence claimed that there was an impending food crisis. They say there was only six days of rice supplies in Phnom Penh. They claim that after this, there would be no food at all. Now, I note that this assertion comes with no references, no sources, no evidence. Equally outrageous is paragraph 261, where the defence states that, I, and I quote, thousands of people would have died in Phnom Penh if the evacuation had not taken place. Again, no sources, no references, just more sweeping statements to excuse the mass crimes. Civil parties gave evidence that loads of rice were taken away from the villages. Denise Alfonco gave evidence that, I quote, after each monsoon, they loaded up the rice stocks from the village. They left a minimum amount for us to have two bowls of soup or porridge per day, and they took all the rest away. We fought over scraps of food with their dogs, and their dogs had more to eat than we did, unquote. If Nunchi and Kirsten Pong really had compassionate intentions, why, under their leadership, were rice supplies taken si away from the villages, leaving the people to starve, pourquoi, leaving the people to fight over scraps of food with the dogs? De riz, et Your honours, the fact that the population de faim, de faim et de se Munchia continues to blame others. He claims to know nothing juges, about what was going on in a country where he was brother Par number two. He denies this title, but that is certainly how everybody knew him and referred to him. Nunchi persistently blames others for the decisions that he made. He blames Prince Sihanouk. He blames Lon Nol. He blames the United States, Vietnam, Thailand. And when that's not enough, he blames the zone leaders and the local leaders and the authorities who implemented the policies which he admits to having made. And in doing so, he demonstrates a total absence of remorse and lack of insight into his criminality then and now. Nunchi does say, perhaps to his credit, at paragraph 210-201 of his brief, that he would like to accept the mistakes that others had made. I quote, because I am the leader. But this mistake is the unintentional result of how we did our jobs, not because of a principle to smash people. This is at odds with Deutsch's evidence that, I quote, in real practice, there was a movement to evacuate the population, and in that evacuation movement, there was a sub-movement to smash people, unquote. Deutsch also gave evidence that, I quote, the policy was that whenever the party regarded someone as an enemy, we had to smash him or her. We had no way to contest it, unquote. Unlike Nun Chia, Doik had no reason to lie. He's already been tried and given a life sentence. He had nothing to gain. Importantly, as the head of S21, he had contemporaneous knowledge about the ins and outs of the regime. Doik said that after Son Sen, Nun Chia was his boss. Your Honours, we ask that you find Doig to be a credible and reliable witness. As for Nunchi's statement that the massive and tragic human consequences of his policies was an unintentional mistake, the civil parties argue that this was no mistake. Nunchi's policies were intentional. They were aimed at a total control of the population by whatever means necessary including at the cost of two million human lives. As the prosecution said, for the senior leaders, the means justified the ends. 
Nunchi's excuses and justifications do nothing to exonerate his individual criminal responsibility before this court. Every decision has its consequences. Nunchi admits responsibility for the decision over forced transfer one. He is therefore necessarily also responsible for the consequences of that decision. He is held to account for his intentional conduct in formulating the policies that authorised and directed others to carry out acts which directly led to the extermination of a large portion of Cambodia's population. The civil parties demand an answer to this question. Knowing what he now knows, would Nunchir have made the same decisions that he did in 1975? We ask that Nunchir personally address this question when he answers in this final statement. Turning to the issue of discriminatory intent against the new people, Nunchir defence argue that Nunchir had no discriminatory intent and therefore cannot be found guilty of the crime of political persecution. They say this is because the new people were treated, and I quote, more like the favoured group, the base people, unquote. In carrying out this line of defence, the Nunchir defence has adopted the same new speak employed by the senior members of the Standing Committee. The defence argue that the new people suffered additional hardships because they were inexperienced with farming. As the theory goes, the new people, I quote, experienced for the first time the difficulties of new life working in the fields, as rural Cambodians had done for millennia, unquote. Contrary to this, your honours have heard civil parties' evidence about working from 5am to 10pm every day, exposed to the rain and sun, without adequate food, under threat of violence and murder, and constantly under the surveillance of Big Brother, Anka. Now, favourable, favourable treatment would normally imply that one has consented to and actually enjoys the treatment received. To demonstrate the forced, coercive nature of the transfer, civil parties Su Sotivi and Yim Sovan both gave evidence that they were ordered to leave the city at gunpoint and threatened to be shot if they did not leave. There has been ample evidence given before this court about the horrific acts against human dignity committed both during and after the forced transfers. I'll not repeat all of that evidence, but in summary, the collective picture painted by the witnesses and civil parties can be described as hell on earth. The Nunchir defence asserts that when they arrived at their destinations, the new people were treated equally as the base people. Well, this is true, insofar as both groups were equally rendered into the condition of slavery. However, the civil parties submit that the new people, in particular, were subjected to discrimination. The first step to discrimination is the identification process. In this case, the evidence is that the new people were identified based on their perceived political affiliation. Civil party Chao Ni gave evidence about being identified as a 17 April person. He said, we were not treated equally. We were regarded as imperialists, or rather, capitalists. They regarded us as those who reaped the benefits of the peasants. Civil parties Jos Fall and Yim Sovan and many others gave evidence that they were required to submit biographies and to identify their previous occupations, their status and those of their family members. Civil party Le Boni said, I quote, their intention was to eradicate us so that newborn people would have new ideas following Ankar's thinking, unquote. This is corroborated by civil party Denise Alfonco, who gave evidence that Ankar wanted to eliminate the entire social class of individuals, intellectuals. They were intentionally letting us die of hunger. It was carefully premeditated and organised from A to Z. Unquote. Now, the second stage to persecution is severely depriving members of a group of one or more of their fundamental human rights. 
The prejudicial effect of Nunchi's policies for the new people was clear and tangible. Uprooted from their homes, the city dwellers were forced to leave all their belongings, their family homes, their livelihoods. All the social structures that sustained their way of living was destroyed. Money and banking, schools and universities, shops and markets, temples and places of worship, these were all eradicated. The people were then expected to refashion themselves to adapt to life in the countryside. Their deprivation of fundamental rights was based on the perceived political affiliations and values. They were classified as capitalists, as feudalists, imperialists, terms that were designated to enemies of the regime. And on this basis, they were deprived of all their fundamental human rights and freedoms. The impact on Phnom Penh residents was shattering. Civil party Tung Sokka describes the evacuation from Phnom Penh could be compared to a bomb exploded to shatter all the families in Phnom Penh. We separated from family members, from friends, and we suddenly lost all that we earned. Apart from the deliberate smashing of supposed enemies, the civil parties also provided ample example and evidence about the deaths that resulted from starvation and the conditions of forced labour in the cooperatives. As for the charges of extermination, both defence teams have disputed the death toll. The civil parties query, how many deaths do the defence consider necessary to meet the threshold for this crime? Whether there was 1 million, 100,000, 1,000, even 100, there is overwhelming evidence that many people were killed. Even Kirsten Pollan's defence have acknowledged that even one victim is one too many. The civil party submits that in law, to make out the crime of extermination, there is no need to establish that any specific number of people died, or that a very large number of people died, so long as all the substantive elements of the crime are made out. Jurisprudence from the Court of Appeal in the ICTY case of Milan Lukic upholds the trial chamber's finding that the killing of 60 people amounted to the crime of extermination as a crime against humanity. The citation for this case is provided in the list of documents that were uh, distributed to parties this morning. So on the totality of facts, civil parties argue that the impact of Nunchi's forced transfer policy on the new people was in fact and was intended to be discriminatory. My learned friend's client might call that favourable treatment, but here's what my client, Mr Nu Huan, has to say. I quote, The so-called organisation at that time was a brutal regime. They wanted Cambodian people to live in freedom, in a sovereign state with territorial integrity. You wanted people to have clothes to wear, shoes to wear, and a cap to wear as well. But the fact was that this policy does not apply to everybody. In other words, there is no one size fits all in their policy. They designed the cap, one size of the cap, and then they forced people to actually wear it. And that does not fit with the people. Now, we cannot actually cut our feet to fit the shoe. It should be the other way around." Unquote. Mr. Nu Huan was speaking specifically about the prejudicial treatment of new people by policies made by the senior leadership. Nunchi's policies, which forced new people to conform to one standard, to become what they are not, with the result of severe harm and mistreatment imposed upon this group, cutting their feet to fit the shoe, as Mr. Nu Huan said. That, Your Honours, in our submission, is the definition of discrimination. We submit that the adverse treatment received by the new people meets the requisite threshold to establish that there was discriminatory intent that was required for the persecution of a civilian population on political grounds as a crimes against humanity.
nécessaire pour qualifier Your Honours, at this point, I'll turn to the subject of forced transfer too, and in particular, about the selective use of witness statements by the Nunchia defence. The defence asks Your Honours to acquit Nunchia on the basis of random extracts of witness statements taken out of context. One example is the defence use of the testimony of civil party Les Bonis. The Nunchia defence asks Your Honours to find that the victims were happy to join in the second population movement because there was more food in Batambang. Conveniently, the defence have omitted the fact that Ms Le Boni had been told by a commune chief that food would be plentiful in Batambang. And this was a pretext to trick her into partaking in the second forced transfer without resisting. The defence also deleted her testimony that she did not volunteer to be transferred but was in fact ordered to go. At the time, Ms Le Bonny was a mother of three young children. Her family had just been forcibly marched from Phnom Penh on foot and without sufficient food. She had a choice to stay in the first cooperative and to face starvation and anticipated punishment for disobeying the order to move or to submit to the second forced transfer with perhaps a faint hope that the conditions in the next cooperative might be a little bit better. Faced with this cash 22, who would not choose the prospect of more suivante. food and the potential possibility of a better life for their children. Face à ce choix, face the Nunchia defence asked Your Honours to find that food and basic necessities were provided to victims of the second forced transfer. La de to support this, de juge de they again misused Le Bonny's testimony, claiming that the physical health of the evacuees was normal. À de leur thèse, la, now, whilst the defence have persistently defense, complained about the importance of providing background and Le context Bonny to the evidence provided before this court, they have no qualms about normal. failing to tell the whole story la when it suits them. If the defence had Mais but read an additional four lines of transcript, they would have seen Ms. Le Bonny's evidence that, I quote, when time passed by, we did not have enough food to eat. We ate the food that was very little. We ate food that made our body parts become swollen. We noted that the pigs had, were given more food than they gave to the human beings, unquote. Si la this is but one example of the defence's irresponsible, selective ceci, use of witness statements passé, to mislead this court when it suits la them. Est venue à manquer, the Nunchia defence have similarly misquoted nos, civil party Yim Sovan and Denise Alfonco and many others. In making factual findings relating to the forced transfers, the civil parties ask that Your Honours give due weight to the civil parties' oral and written testimony and to abstain from taking defense the defence assertions at face value without close scrutiny. Your Honours, at this point, I'll turn to the topic of two portraits, and in particular, of the existence of a policy to execute former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. The evidence of civil parties, both live and in statements admitted by this chamber, taken in combination, demonstrate that the Khmer Republic officials were targeted as enemies of the regime, and they were targeted in an organized, uniform, widespread and systematic manner. As such, the policy can be established through the accumulation of evidence from the direct witnesses on the ground, evincing the ill treatment and killing of this composition in the pattern. The witnesses and civil parties have been removed from the process of the formulation of these high-level policies, but they can tell you what they saw from where they stood. Your Honours, I am aware that I'm running out of a little bit of time, and I won't go through the civil party testimonies in relation to the ill-treatment and targeting of non-null regime uh, members, but Your Honours are asked to make factual findings on the accumulation of circumstantial evidence. If Your Honours are satisfied that the totality of evidence given about the identification, singling out, torture, ill-treatment and executions of former non-null officials is credible, and that this treatment was implemented in a uniform, systematic and widespread manner, Your Honours can reasonably and logically infer from these facts 
that the implementation was conducted in accordance with the centrally formulated policy instructions from the senior leaders. I move now to fair trial rights. It's quite an indulgence for the Nunchia team to stand before the population of victims in Cambodia and state that Nunchia has La not been afforded the Simpson presumption of innocence. All I can say, in contrast, is that his victims were never given any presumption of innocence before they were subjected to torture, ill-treatment, arbitrary detention or summary executions. The victims at S21 come to mind particularly as they face certain extrajudicial killings, and Nunchi knows very well what went on in S21. His national defence conceded that he received 25 out of over 4,000 confessions, of which six of which he personally annotated. As for the establishment of the extraordinary chambers, Nunchi argues that this hybrid tribunal was established because a domestic court might not try the case to international standards. But he also claims that he can never have a fair trial because most of the judicial officers in this court are nationals of France, the United States and their closest allies. Using Khmer Rouge logic, the defence has called this a trial against ideology, arguing that the judges could never fairly adjudicate this matter because they come from the same so-called imperialist countries from which Nunchia purportedly sought to protect Cambodia. Apart from demonstrating a high degree of disrespect for this judicial process, these remarks actually bear a close resemblance to speech which propagates discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity and nationality. The argument being that, by virtue of being French or being of Anglo-Saxon origin, your honours are inherently biased and are unable to appropriately or competently or impartially adjudicate and apply the facts, evidence and law. Perhaps what Nunchia is actually saying is that no court, whether domestic or international, has the capacity or independence or competence to try him. Perhaps what he means is that he should not be tried at all. But for the masses of victims, this trial is about the end of impunity. In respect to the need to call witnesses to establish Nunchi's intent, it is our submission that any evidence that any other person could possibly provide about Nunchi's intentions would constitute hearsay, opinion evidence, or inadmissible speculation. From the civil party's perspective, who better to know the intentions of Nunchia than the man himself? But rather than subjecting himself to be examined and cross-examined in the ordinary way of giving evidence, Nunchia instead waits to have the last word, the final statements. Let me make it very clear so that the defence do not twist my words in saying that the victims do not respect the rule of law. The civil party certainly respects Nunchi's rights to remain silent and at the same time to challenge the evidence against him. For sure, giving Nunchi all the due process that his victims never received is indeed the right way to try this man. Ultimately, the Nunchia defence claims that this trial is a manifestation of victor's justice. Well, the civil parties have waited nearly 40 years for justice, for truth's light to be shed in a forum such as this. But even if there is a conviction on these limited charges, the victims are certainly not winners. To the contrary, they have suffered irreparable loss, unspeakable harm, and in these circumstances, one cannot say that a conviction would mean that they have won. In conclusion, this trial is about the initial movements, the initial moments when the Khmer Rouge took power on 17 April 1975, and how those first few days changed Cambodian history forever. The participation of the civil parties has enabled this process to meet with, present and to confront the human faces behind the tragic history, the faces of both the victims and the perpetrators of criminal policies that were executed in the name of the faceless Onka. Justice comes in many forms and in a, rule, in a court of law, the civil parties 
la justice pour them, prendre justice manifests as the right to be heard and to be believed devant un tribunal right pour les parties civiles, la justice, c'est le droit right d'être entendu, d'être cru, le droit de voir reconnaître ce préjudice, le droit à réparation. Les parties civiles confient à ce tribunal la tâche Your de Honours, rendre la justice. Je mérite les parties civiles. Voici qui met fin à ma réplique concernant la plaidoirie de Nunchia. Ma consoeur, Maître Mok Sovanari, va répliquer à la plaidoirie de Kyosan. Your Honours, good morning, members of the public, and good morning to the civil parties whom I am representing. I will try to be brief and I try to be as specific as possible to the points raised by the defence team of Mr. Kyu Sampon. I would now like to address the uh, personality and role of Mr. Kilsen Pond during the Democratic Cambodia too. I will uh, touch upon the reliability of the uh, testimony as well as uh, evidence presented before the chamber. And lastly, I will present about the uh, statement of the uh, civil parties uh, or who were not uh, summoned to testify before the chamber and the reliability of those uh, statements. And uh, finally, I would like to present about the uh, methodology employed by the defense team of uh, Mr. Kilsen Pond and uh, in relation to the various evidence brought up by the defense team. And I also uh, look at the uh, facts of the alleged uh, crimes concerning the two phases of evacuation. And uh, if time allows, I will make an observation on uh, the uh, evidence concerning uh, the policy against the official of uh, Lon Nol regime and that this policy was uh, implemented by the Khmer Rouge during the Khmer Rouge uh, period. Over the last uh, two days uh, hearing, particularly when the defense team for Kilsen Pon raised, he has repeatedly uh, made um, uh, and tried to have the chamber uh, believe uh, that Mr. Kilsen Pon was of good personality. And in addition, he uh, tried to present uh, various good qualities of Mr. Kilsen Pon that people talk about uh, it during the uh, during the Sankum uh, era. He said that uh, Kilsen Pon was a serious, meticulous person. Now I would like to present to the chamber that what has been raised by the defense team is not at all correct. They raised about the uh, testimony of Mr. Pong who said that uh, Mr. Kilsen Pon versus Mr. Clean, I would like to make a, a, a clear observation that uh, it is easy for Mr. Pong So, who did not go through the Khmer Rouge period, who did not suffer uh, during this regime. He describes uh, Mr. Kilsen Pon as Mr. Clean during the Sankum Brinijum era. That was not at all relevant to what happened during the Democratic Cambodia period. And I would like to say that the civil parties were the survivors of the Khmer Rouge. They did not believe uh, at all what the defense team for Kilsampon raised uh, in this trial. Myself, I did not come across this regime. I was a younger generation of uh, Cambodian who was born after the regime, but uh, I was, I uh, almost believe what the defense team uh, said, but uh, based on the various evidence and uh, testimony of witnesses and victims, uh, I cannot uh, believe what the defense uh, raised, and I believe that he was not as clean as what other might have presumed. Now, the defense team have um, told the chamber that he was a meticulous uh, person. So this is clear in itself that he must have known what have uh, happened uh, during uh, that time, uh, including the people who uh, rely their fate uh, in the hands of the select few of the leaders of the Khmer Rouge. The defense team uh, for Kilsen Pond said that Mr. Kilsen Pond was an intellectual. Based on the statute of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, he did not satisfy the criteria to become a person trustworthy by the uh, CPK. That was not a correct uh, assumption, and I believe that this is a failure in itself uh, to raise this point uh, as a defense uh, for this case. As uh, the chamber may be well aware uh, that during the Khmer Rouge period, the intellectual 
were recalled back to Cambodia, and they were all, uh, almost all were uh, executed, and uh, most of them were executed at S21. So we can ask a literal question uh, why Mr. Kiu Sampon uh, was there uh, during the entire period, and instead he was appointed a leadership position of this regime. Why was not he sent for re-education or uh, to put it uh, simply the language used during the Khmer Rouge period uh, was uh, sent for smashing, but instead uh, he was appointed uh, numerous important uh, positions as the prosecutor have already uh, brought them up. And following the uh, demise of this regime, he has never admitted that this regime committed any wrongdoing. He never said that uh, Pol Pot had committed the uh, crimes of, um, uh, against humanity. So what uh, does this say? Of course, uh, he was um, the allies of Pol Pot, he was the allies of this regime. Now, if we look at the situation when people were being evacuated of uh, their homes and the execution of the people uh, afterwards, it demonstrate that uh, he participated with conviction that he wanted to uh, be part of the policy to transform Cambodia to be a great leap forward country, a glorious regime, uh, when people were forced uh, to work in the rice field, when people had to work in uh, in the field where uh, the corpses of their uh, national compatriots were uh, buried. Concerning the reliability of the um, statements of the civil parties as well as the testimony uh, in court uh, by civil parties, I would like to um, inform uh, the chamber that uh, the defense team for Kiu Sampon uh, tried to manipulate the statements of the uh, civil parties as well as witnesses. Uh, in June 2012, the chamber never uh, guaranteed to the defense uh, team uh, that those documents uh, were uh, considered was assured uh, that the written statement admitted without cross-examination would be entitled to little or no weight. Rather, this chamber has stated uh, that no, uh, under no, circum no uncertain terms, in no uncertain terms, rather, that uh, where civil party written statement go to proof of matters other than the uh, acts or conduct of the accused, or otherwise meet the criteria of Internal Rule 87.3, the Chamber can find this evidence admissible without requiring the individual's attendance at trial or may, under uh, certain circumstances uh, or under certain conditions, rely on this material. And all those in uh, paragraph 29, the chamber um, provides that the applicant, uh, application of the civil parties uh, submitted by the intermediary, intermediary org organization uh, may provide little weight, uh, but or ultimately uh, be able to afford a little weight, if any, in line with the international jur jurisprudence and practice, it was careful to preserve its right to access what, if any, property value and weight uh, may be afforded such, uh, afforded such evidence. The Chamber has also carefully reasoned and laid out the factors which favor admitting and affording property value to these statements. The defense team for Nguyen Chir uh, thus far have not raised any assertion uh, against the uh, specific uh, testimony uh, provided by the civil parties. Based on the statements uh, submitted to the chamber, I would like to inform the chamber that they have uh, provided highly probative value of evidence, including the uh, personal experience to the chamber concerning the existence of crimes as the foundation to support their testimony in, in, the, in addition to the elements of the alleged crimes uh, committed. And those evidence um, demonstrate very clearly uh, the sufferings that they have uh, sustained.
Now, I would like to make uh, some observation concerning the, um, the defense for Kiu Sampon when he uh, made his closing statement. The first uh, issue that I would like to inform the chamber concerning the uh, excerpt of the testimony uh, they uh, brought up in their final brief as well as in the closing statement. Uh, Your Honours, I uh, am convinced that what the uh, defence teams uh, have uh, brought up was truncated and they, uh, it was meant to manipulate the uh, testimonies of those uh, witnesses and civil parties. And in the interest of justice and uh, in search for truth, the, uh, the civil party lawyers would like to ask the Chamber to be um, cautious uh, when analysing and, uh, the um, quote as well as the uh, excerpts brought up by the defense team for Kiu Sam Pon. Now I would like to bring up some example concerning the testimony of Mr. Pong Shou. The defense team uh, raised a number of uh, portion from the testimony of Mr. Pong Shou. Uh, they said uh, that uh, Pong Shou uh, testified before the chamber that the Khmer Rouge uh, were kind to the people and the uh, Lono soldier on the other hand was very cruel and unkind to the people and then people were left with no choice but to join the Khmer Rouge. En conséquence de quoi, les gens n'ont pas eu d'autre choix que de se And I would like to uh, inform the chamber that Mr. Pong Shou actually said that uh, Khmer Rouge were uh, cruel, Khmer Rouge were good at lying, Khmer Rouge mistreated people wherever they conquered uh, in the war, they would burn down the villages, they killed the village head. And they uh, chased uh, the people out and they uh, took the people with them and uh, uh, re relocate uh, them in the forest. And according to Mr. Pongshou's testimony on the 10th of April uh, 2010 at uh, 10, uh, 11, 26, uh, Mr. Pongshou said Khmer Rouge um, became uh, cruel from 1973 following the uh, bombardment of American uh, troops. And then he uh, continued on that following 1973, we knew clearly what the Khmer Rouge uh, did with the people uh, in the countryside. They uh, burned down villages, they killed the village head, and they relocated people in the jungle. And uh, we thought at that time that the Khmer Rouge was cruel because it was part of the strategy in the war, and we hope that once they conquered the war, uh, they would relax uh, on their uh, treatment to the people, but actually we were mistaken. We were seriously mistaken. The Khmer Rouge was really cruel. Concerning the flow of people, the influx of people into uh, Phnom Penh City, the defense team say that it was due to the looming bombardment, the imminent bombardment of American uh, troops. I would like to refer to page 2 of this transcript, uh, page 12 of this transcript. They say that at that time, uh, uh, Khmer, uh, Phnom Penh had around 3 uh, million uh, people. They were uh, frightened. They were frightened of the Khmer Rouge. They were frightened of the uh, imminent bombardment of the uh, American troops. He said that they were uh, coming to Phnom Penh at that time because they were afraid of the Khmer Rouge. In relation to the assertion that the defense team said that people um, welcomed the Khmer Rouge when they marched their way into uh, Phnom Penh in April 1975, and Mr. Pongso said that from uh, 1973 to the glo glorious day of the 17th of April, uh, people uh, were living in miserable condition, and he said that uh, the people were miserable at that time was not because of the consequences of the bombardment, but because of the mistreatment of the Khmer Rouge because uh, the Khmer Rouge mistreated the people. And he further uh, testified that uh, when the Khmer Rouge came, uh, we were very frightened. We were frightened because we knew that the Khmer Rouge was very cruel and we did not know what would happen to the people after they uh, control uh, the power. That was the testimony provided by Mr. Pong Shou. Now I move to the testimony by Mr. Stephen Hatter and uh, the defense team, uh, Madame Ong Ta Gise uh, said that uh, the Anka could not control the situation on the ground in the countryside. And I would like to now enlighten the chamber on this point. Madame Defense Counsel said that based on the testimony of Mr. Stephen Hader, he said the center, party center, could not control the situation on the ground. So I would like to uh, refer to the uh, transcript of Mr. Uh, Hedder's testimony. Uh, I quote. Uh, 
They said that the intellectual, the intellectual in Phnom Penh did not know what happened in the countryside. But I would like to make it clear that the intellectual that he was referring to in this particular point was the intellectuals who were not the members of the party, those intellectuals who remained in Phnom Penh city. And he further added that uh, there were certain other points that there were other people who told him about that, but there were some uh, contradictory accounts uh, of this fact as well. And there were certain cases is when um, certain individuals who were among those uh, intellectuals who had been to the countryside as well. I do not have much time, so I would like to now move on to another testimony of Mr. Felix Sharp. Of course, Mr. Viet Gun um, raised uh, a lot of points uh, concerning uh, the testimony of Mr. Uh, Philip Short. They say that Mr. Philip Short was not qualified to be an expert witness. He did not have knowledge about this uh, regime, so on and so forth. And But Mr. Kilsampon, actually, the, the, the def national defense team for Mr. Kilsampon uh, did raise uh, a few um, excerpts from the testimony of Mr. Philip Short. I would like to ask bluntly as to which uh, Short uh, he was uh, quoting was the Short that he find the short testimonies that he finds relevant or the Les short uh, testimony that he finds uh, unreliable. Uh, mm. Now, he also raised the point concerning the def, uh, civil party testimony who said uh, that Mr. Q. Sampon was a clean and corrupt free person. He did not accept the bribe uh, of a Mercedes, so on and so forth. And I believe that this is um, a manipulation of the testimony of the uh, civil party. Of course, the civil party said that uh, Mr. Q. Sampon refused the um, uh, a gift of a Mercedes, but uh, the um, the civil uh, the, that civil party made it very clear that that uh, he learned about this uh, through rumor. He did not actually have the direct uh, information about that. Concerning the context of uh, the war between 1970 to 1975, the defense team uh, brought up the uh, testimony of Mr. Pong Shou. Uh, they said, uh, "Where the elephant fight." Uh, the ants uh, got killed. And at that time, of course, Cambodia was uh, in the state of war. And I would like to put the question back to the defense teams. Who were considered the elephants in this context? Who were the ants? The elephant. The elephant was uh, the American, American troops who were uh, alleged uh, to be uh, to uh, bombard the city, and uh, who else was the elephant? Uh, the Khmer Rouge. The Khmer Rouge was indeed one of the elephants. Who were the ants? The ants was the victims, the Cambodian people, the ordinary Cambodian people, uh, who were the ants who got killed as a result of this fighting. Regarding Kilsampon's decision in making a decision to evacuate people from Phnom Penh, the council really criticized people in the statement that his statement cannot be relied upon due to his confusion. Allow me to remind the chamber regarding the actual testimony given by this witness when he was asked questions by the council. If we look at the transcript of this witness on the 2nd of August 2012, when Kirsten Pond Defense put the questions to the witness, we could see that the techniques employed by the Defense Council were reminded and warned 13 times. They were warned not to ask repetitive questions, substantial questions, leading questions, or difficult questions. And they were redirected to cite the actual site or the proper extracts in their questioning. The council also added that Case and Paul did not participate in that uh, meeting to decide on the evacuation, as Nuti said. Allow me to remind the chamber that Nuti is one of the co-accused. So please use your common sense whether this accused testimony is credible. Il faut se demander si le témoignage de cet autre accusé est crédible. As they were the rest issue of uh, American bombardment, controls uh, people were scared, and the Khmer Rouge soldiers were also affected by the bombardment, and the Khmer Rouge said they believed that there would be imminent bombardment. But Poncho's actual transcript on page 15 
that is on the 10th of April 2013, he stated that I do not believe that Americans would drop bombs. But some people may believe because uh, during the last two years, Americans dropped some bombs. But myself, I don't believe it. Neither the Khmer Rouge. That is a punctual testimony which were left out by the Defense Council. Punch also added uh, on page 13 of the transcript that in addition to the American bombardments or the cleaning of the city, Ensuite, the, purpose, the purposes of the Khmer Rouge was that the Khmer Rouge country told me uh, if the people uh, in the cities go to the countryside to have ways to plan si the rise, they, then they will learn to know the value, the real value of everything. He also added that on page 19 in the Khmer language, the Anka was skillful in lying to the people. They used the pretext for people to return to Phnom Penh and later they were executed. They asked their names to be registered on the blackboard and Anka would uh, give them their previous position. That was a lie, a lie to kill. Once again, uh, Your Honor, civil party would like to urge that because of those lies, they were forced to leave their peaceful homes to wander into miseries, as uh, Your Honors have heard. Regarding the lack of food during the evacuation, the council said it's because of the food shortage that led to the evacuation. However, after the entire regime, food shortage was still an issue. And another question asked by the victims and ordinary people that if they have the sufficient reason for food shortage, why they needed to lie to the people of the American bombardment. They could tell the people the truth because of the food shortage that people were evacuated. And that they should be returned to Phnom Penh after the resettlement, but that was not the case. Regarding the uh, concretely speech by Kyo Sampon for the 17 April victory, the council on Kangushe said Kyo Sampon made a speech to congratulate the victory of the Khmer Rouge, and that was not uh, illegal, but he congratulated it because his political conception uh, became realized. I'd like to invite the chambers to actually read the arguments concerning the role and the duty of Kyo Sampon as submitted by the Council of Kyo Sampon. Kyo Sampon said he forced himself to join the Khmer Rouge movement. The question can be asked by your honors that if Kyo Sampon did not volunteer to join the movement, why he had to congratulate the victory? Was it not because of his political idea realized? His idea is one and the same of the ideas by the Khmer Rouge leaders, as he was one of them. Another point uh, argued by Kiss and Posse Fund is that uh, when people were evacuated from Phnom Penh, that they would only need a, a few weeks. And why did they need four months for the second phase evacuation? On a pu that is from 75 to early 76. And my argument is that. Kiss and Posse Fund forget one thing when they review the evidence. There will be testimonies by both the witnesses, the civil parties, and the contemporary document of the Khmer Rouge that evacuation was cumulative, and there was no set ending to each phase of the evacuation. Many of the civil party testimonies confirm that. When he was settled, asked to settle into one location, a few months later, he was moved again. So there is no real point of raising this set evacuation time by the council. 
Donc, they arrest that uh, the evacuees were, were happy en tant que tel. La défense affirme As they que returned to, from Phnom Penh to their native villages, ordinaires uh, testified in, uh, before your chamber that the person returned from Badam Bon to Phnom Penh, and later on, he was evacuated to Badam Bon, but was not allowed to go to the same native village. After one month, my Donc, name was uh, put on the list, and, a month, a and with other families, we were asked to put on to a motorboat to another location. And to conclude my rebuttal statement, as your honors, Mesdames et messieurs les juges, I would like to remind the accused case in Pawn that humanity is one main factor that all leaders should consider as a priority, a priority in leading the nation and the people. Uh, Here I stand to speak about humanity, not about your psychology là, or the ideology. Humanity and people should be taken care of by the leader and the government. They les are not subject of a war. And, and you have to consider the sacrifice guerre. that they, they make during your leadership. You said that you always love the country and the people. You made that statement clear before this chamber, before the victims. victims. And that you have to be responsible for what happened under your leadership, that this country became a killing field and it left a very dark chapter in the history for the next generations of the Cambodian people. And I believe your idea, your patriotism, might prevent you from being the popular figurehead of that a regime, and of course it cannot be, and it can be said for this generation or the next generation, yet you gradually bow your head to acknowledge what happened, you may be pardoned and forgiven by millions of victims under your regime of a three years, eight months and twenty days, and finally the civil parties believe that all the questions that they have concealed or they have asked themselves or amongst each other is why? Why such acts were committed and that was raised during the first day of the closing statement de by the litco lawyer. Uh, the victims believe that after this historical trial all these questions can be answered and they will get the answers and that is the questions. importance of their participation as a party voilà to this criminal proceeding in the names of uh, victims to this grievous crime that is the crimes against humanity. I'm grateful to you all. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, The chamber would like now to give the floor to the prosecution La parole va être so that uh, they can make their rebuttal statement. You may proceed. Good morning, Mr. President, Your Honors. This year, on the 29th of May, in this courtroom, Bonjour, civil party Ho Chan Ta appeared before Your Honors and told the court about losing 22 members of her family during the regime of democratic Kampuchea and how those events had affected the rest of her life. And she told you, and I quote, today I am so excited that I am given the opportunity by this international court who crossed the oceans in order to come here to find justice for them and for the Cambodian people. This is the day I have been waiting for more than 30 years. And she added, to your honors, I would like to make a request, which is the International Court 
J'aimerais to judge fairly and justly in proportion to the gravity of the crimes. De les juger Mr. President, Your Honors, that is all we ask on behalf of the co-prosecutors, that you judge this case fairly and justly in proportion to the gravity. If the evidence did not prove the accused guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, it is your duty to acquit. But we have shown you that the evidence in this case is clear and convincing, and the evidence of the crimes and the gravity of the crimes proves the accused guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and justifies the sentence that the co-prosecutor, Chea Liang, asked you for last week, a sentence of life in prison. Your Honors, it's a privilege to appear in this court in these Mesdames historic proceedings. My name is Nicholas Kumjin. Uh, I will address you briefly, je, je mainly Nicolas regarding the legal requirements of Kumjian. joint criminal enterprise. Je, then my colleagues, Keith Rayner, will address you, uh, address you on issues regarding the specific crimes commune, that we are dealing Keith with Rayner in case 0201. My colleague Dale Lysak will address specifically issues related to the responsibility of Nun Chia, and Tariq Abdul Haq will address issues related to the liability of Q Sampan. Over the four previous days of court hearings, we heard submissions from very talented experienced, uh, well-staffed defense teams nous avons entendu les équipes de défense uh, vigorously defending their clients. But what they told you is that this entire trial clients. is a propaganda exercise vous a dit on behalf of the backers of the court rien and is, is and never was intended de ceux qui to prove the truth of the charges, ce tribunal, that it's just propaganda. Their very arguments disprove that allegation. Your honors allowed them for four days to put forth all of these allegations and all of these arguments before galleries filled with hundreds of people broadcast over the internet to the world. So this is not a propaganda exercise. The defense has been given every opportunity to make its allegations. This is a trial dealing with the truth. And in our submissions, those truths are that the accused in this case are responsible for some of the gravest crimes committed in history. All of these arguments were done by the defense without any interference from the court, from any donors of the court, or from any other source. They were free to say what they wished to say. They've argued that the verdicts, convictions in this case, are predetermined. We agree that the evidence is so strong that the only just verdict in this case are convictions, just verdicts, are convictions of the accused. But that's based on the evidence. If what the defense alleges were true, where is Ing Tarit? We started this trial with four accused, but your honors ruled that because of her mental incompetence, Ing Tarit could not get a fair trial. So what these proceedings have shown is that every effort is being made to assure the accused get a fair trial. The defense would have you believe that Q Sampan and Nun Chia are victims of an international conspiracy. This is both illogical and delusional. There is no need by anyone 
in the international community or in Cambodia to discredit the Khmer Rouge. They are already discredited. They have no popular support, no international support today. They are politically and militarily inconsequential. This case isn't about politics or propaganda. It's about addressing crimes, historic crimes of the greatest magnitude that happened a long time ago. But in this international, the international law is going to mean anything. Crimes of this gravity cannot be ignored. The defense even attacked the prosecutors and your honors, the judges, saying that we were incapable of understanding their clients because, among other reasons, we come from capitalist countries, some of us, and former colonial powers. Who actually made these arguments on behalf of the defense? Lawyers from the former colonial Asian colonial powers of France and Australia. They make the argument that the prosecutors and the judges must be following the orders of other states. But it's clear. I compliment them. They did a tremendous job for their clients. They have very talented teams. They fought vigorously, and they continue to fight vigorously on behalf of their clients. Clearly, although funded by the court, clearly, although they are lawyers from France and from the Netherlands, and many of their colleagues from the United States, taking orders from no one, trying to uphold justice on behalf of their clients, this proves that there is no uh, interference, uh, that it, we are capable of doing our duty. There is an arrogance, frankly, in that defense argument, a feeling Cet of moral superiority that somehow defense counsel are capable of fulfilling their roles in the system of justice, uh, but prosecutors and judges are not. And for those who may not have that experience, this is not the first seraient. time in an international tribunal that desperate defense teams have made that allegation. Uh, just recently, in the appeal decision, in the trial of the former president of Liberia, Charles Taylor, the appeal court addressed very similar allegations by the defense for Charles Taylor. In paragraph one, excuse me, 717, the con concurring opinion of Justices Winter and Fisher stated, furthermore, suggesting that the judges of this court would be open to the argument that we should change the law or fashion our decision in the interests of officials of states that provide support for this or any international criminal court is an affront to international criminal law and the judges who serve it. The defense has interjected a political and highly inappropriate conceit into these proceedings, which has no place in courts of law and which has found no place in the judgment of this court. And we are confident that the same is true uh, for your honors. The defense arguments we also believe have assisted in focusing on what are the real issues in this case. Because the defense have made it clear there are many concessions we submit in the defense arguments. Q Sampan was the public face of that regime. He doesn't, it seems to us, the defense team does not deny that. He was the representative internationally and to the Cambodian people. Nun Chia's team repeatedly acknowledged he was second in command of the CPK in the Democratic Republic of Kampuchea, those that ruled the country during that regime. So really, I believe what we have a, can agree on with the defense is this trial is about the policies of the CPK, of Democratic Kampuchea, of the Khmer Rouge. Were those policies criminal? 
Or were they legitimate? Were they simply fulfilling their ideological beliefs? Or did their actions amount to crimes? In our view, the answer is absolutely clear. Throughout that regime, there was a campaign of crimes directed against the Cambodian people. Ideology is not the issue in this case. The accused are not being prosecuted because of their ideology. They could, be, could have been espousing capitalism. They could have been espousing a fascist ideology. It doesn't matter if people are advocating a religion or theocracy, or they claim that they are taking actions to fight terrorism. When governments or those in power in order to achieve whatever political objectives they have, subject citizens, civilians, to crimes such as persecution, enslavement, torture, murder, that is a violation of international law. It is not their ideology that's at stake. It's not their ideology that we attempt to discredit. They discredited themselves with the four years of crimes against the people of Kampuchea that that regime carried out. And, Your Honor, we have, in our submissions, discussed various modes of responsibility that apply legally to the crimes that took place. I'm going to concentrate on one, and that is joint criminal enterprise, because we believe it is probably the mode of responsibility that best describes the conduct. That ultimately will be up to your honors. The case law is clear that when multiple different modes are applicable, it's up to the trial chamber to choose the one that they believe best fits the facts of this case. I'm not going to go through all of the basics of joint criminal enterprise because it was described absolutely accurately in your own judgment in case 01, in the case against Doik, in paragraphs 507 and 508, where you talked about the requirements, particularly of the first two categories of joint criminal enterprise. The basic category were all accused, agree on a crime, a plurality of persons agree on a crime, and then the, the, the accused has made a significant contribution to the enterprise. And the second category, which is a systematic uh, joint criminal enterprise where characterized by an organized system of mistreatment. Your honors have made clear in those paragraphs what also has been well established in international law. The second category, systematic, Joint criminal enterprise is simply a variant of the first. It's a variant that is usually used to describe concentration camps, vast prisons, systems of mistreatment. And it is extraordinary, we admit, certainly extraordinary, to apply that principle to an entire country. We submit, though, that the facts of democratic Kampuchea were extraordinary. Democratic Kampuchea is not similar to other historic events and was a system nationwide of mistreatment of the citizens of Cambodia. The only difference that the cases articulate and your honors articulated between JC1 and 2 is how you articulate the intent the intent in one is that each of the accused has the intent to commit a crime under the jurisdiction of the court. They all agree on that. And in JC2, it is that the accused is aware of a system of mistreatment involving crimes under the jurisdiction of the court and intends to further that system. In my view, those are actually identical, because Sur if you are aware of a system of mistreatment involving si crimes, you intend to further that system crimes, that those crimes, you have the intent for those crimes. De poursuivre ce système, 
et ces crimes et donc l'intention de commettre ces crimes to existe. Well in Un élément bien établi en droit international et qu'il convient de comprendre est que l'objectif final déclaré des membres de l'entreprise criminelle commune if the means that they n'est pas contemplate forcément to criminel. Use to achieve that result are themselves criminal. And this is applicable to this case where the closing si order articulates a joint criminal enterprise as, I believe, um, seeking a rapid socialist revolution and to protect themselves from perceived enemies. Et la protection de ce régime that in itself, as the closing perçus. order acknowledges, is not criminal. But the closing order makes it clear that the accused intended all of the crimes charged as a means to achieve that. And that's from the closing order, the, the specific paragraph showing that the accused are charged with intending all of the crimes are paragraphs 1524, 1533, 1537. This issue came up again in a decision in the Charles Taylor case. There was a decision of the appeal chamber from the 1st of May 2009, where the appeal chamber reaffirmed, quote, that the common purpose comprises both the objective of the JCE and the means contemplated to achieve that objective. In Taylor, the objective was charged as controlling the people and resources, excuse me, the people and territory of Sierra Leone and in order to exploit the resources not itself a violation of international law, but the indictment made clear that was to be achieved by means of terrorizing the civilian population in order to control the means and territory. So the appeal chamber found the indictment proper because the means that were contemplated to achieve the JCE were criminal. Similarly, in the Martich case, from the ICTY, the indictment had charged an objective of uniting ethnically similar areas. And the appeal judgment, paragraph 123, stated that the objective of uniting these areas was not itself a criminal purpose, but, quote, where the creation of such territories is intended to be implemented through the commission of crimes within the statute. This may be sufficient to amount to a common criminal purpose. And one thing important to keep in mind Intent is not the same as motive. It is not necessary to show a person intended a crime to show that that was the specific objective that they sought, so long as it is clear that they were aware that the consequence of their action would, in all likelihood, it's articulated different ways in different systems and the natural course of events would, would achieve that result. This is how your honors describe that uh, intent in case 01, in your judgment in paragraph 481. The accused must have acted with the intent to commit the crime or with an awareness of the substantial likelihood that the crime would occur as a consequence of his or her conduct. De la perpétration de the Lubanga judgment, the International Criminal Court, dealing with a very similar mode of responsibility that they call their co-perpetration, said in uh, paragraphs 986 and 987 that the elements are established if, quote, implementation embodies a sufficient risk that in the ordinary course of events a crime will be committed. And the appeal, the uh, trial chamber in Lubanga found that Article 30 of the ICC statute, which deals with intent, is satisfied if, quote, co-perpetrators are aware of the risk that the consequence, prospectively, will occur. And this is extremely relevant to this case and some of the defense arguments. Because, Your Honors, there can be no doubt in that forced transfer 
uh, from Phnom Penh de in April of 1975. Many people were dying of starvation, de of dehydration, de of lack de of medical care. People whose undoubtedly médicaux, names Kusam Pan Nunchia do not know. Donc, people who, who's, who they never met, and it's not necessary for us to show that they intended that specific death. De What's necessary to show is simply that they were aware that the consequence of their action, in this case, expelling millions of people de with no notice in April from the Phnom Penh de Phnom Penh would result avril, in these deaths would result in killings uh, and other crimes that occurred in the course of these transfers. Further, Your Honor's intent may be inferred. That is clear from the case law. It can be inferred, inferred in many ways. In Krajishnik, at paragraph 890, the trial chamber and the trial judgment said that the information the accused received during this period is an important element for the determination of his responsibility. Because knowledge, combined with continuing participation, can be conclusive as to a person's intent. And this is exactly what the evidence shows with Nun Chia and Q. Sampan who continued as second in command and as the public face, the representative of the Khmer Rouge, clearly with information knowing about the ongoing crimes and terror, they continued to participate, demonstrating without doubt this was their intent to further these crimes. In Kavachka appeal judgment, paragraph 243, the ICTY appeal chamber said an intent to further the efforts of the joint criminal enterprise, quote, may also be inferred from knowledge of the crimes being perpetrated in the camp and continued participation in the functioning of the camp. So we see when the crimes are obvious, when the crimes are ongoing and accused, particularly one in such high positions of responsibility, continues to participate in, in those uh, efforts in the system of mistreatment. That itself is proof of their intent, the necessary intent to convict them for those crimes. Your Honor, this could be a convenient point to break, if you, Mr. President, if you would like. Or I could continue. President, thank you, Prosecutor. The time is appropriate for a short break. We will take a break now and return at 10 to 11. SoundCloud Show.